12:35-44. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a pen. And he calls his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Mark 12, 35 through 44 ESV. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. How are you doing? I'm looking great this morning. Such a cool, crisp morning. It feels like fallout. Uh, hey, um, if you haven't noticed, there's the, we have some prayer cards in the back um, that are on that little wagon, little cart thing. Uh, because uh, we want to pray for you. All right? We, we don't want to just uh, to, um, say we pray, but be a praying church. And so there's cards back there. If you have a prayer request, it could be anything. Um, and that you would like us to be praying for, maybe you, you jot it down and you hand it to someone specifically and say, hey, we'd be praying for this. If not, you can drop it in the offering box. We'll, we'll get it and uh, we'll be praying for you and checking in with that. But we just, we'd like to, um, yeah, we, we really want to be praying uh, for your needs and things you, you have in your personal lives. So please take advantage of those prayer cards in the back uh, as well. So again, you could. Uh, today's passage is, is, is we, we were coming to the end of, uh, we're, we're at the end of part 12, of all of these interrogating questions, and now Jesus is going to flip the script and ask a question. He's going to ask a question, um, and we're going to see, uh, today we're going to, well let me just read the title of my sermon, and you might think of what in the world, how is the inside of the truth? Like, are we going to talk about trees this morning? No, but we're going to do a deep delve into our hearts. My, the, the aim this morning is to help you see that what is it that motivates you to obedience? And then we're going to delve into our hearts this morning and see, are we operating at a Christianity from the outside in or from the inside out? So that's where we're going again. Let me, let me pray once more. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here. Thank you that your word is powerful. Thank you that there is um, there's, there's massive truth here this morning. And I pray that, Father, you remove me, remove any distraction. Um, here's, here's the notes, here's the thing we prepared. And I just pray again that you would be magnified and glorified. Proclamation of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, I do really love truths. Alright? Um, one of the things that was about to make me not come out of here was lack of truths. That was just to see, maybe be honest, me out. No. Uh, because of the foliage, uh, is that the foliage? I don't know if I said that right. Whatever, I'm uh, But it was just, it's, it's immaculate, um, word of word. And just, the changing of, and it's amazing that the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful tree right in front of us. But I love trees, and I learned something about trees this year, uh, this week that I didn't really know before. Uh, and you probably know about this, but there's this thing called heart rot. Everybody heard of heart rot before? Yeah, okay, that's right. I knew you were chatting. Knew it, knew it. Uh, so heart rot is this thing 
that is this fungus that attacks the inside of a tree. Okay, and specifically, it even attacks heart, those those giant uh, redwoods, um, and it, it, you know it attacks the inside of the tree. So um, the inside is rotting out, and the outside looks beautiful and magnificent. All right, and it looks beautiful and magnificent. Like, um, and like you think oh, I could, you know, drive my Ford 150 through that and knock it down, um, and you might be right. Um, because the, the reality is, when, when heart rot sinks into a tree, and it begins to just corrode it from the inside coming out, it, I mean, a common man or woman could walk up and simply push it over. The outside looks beautiful. Like there's nothing wrong. But on the inside, it's rotten. And it just takes a little push and falls. Free on the outside, but on the inside, not so good. I think that's somewhat of the human condition um, of what we love to do. We love pretty on the outside. You know, it's, this is, it's, let's make sure the outside looks all good. Um, don't, don't, do not let anybody see the inside. And, and we come in church and, how you doing, brother? Oh, Pastor, how are you feeling? Ooh, it's good, sunshine, and everything's great. And on the inside is, I mean, we do this a lot. And, see, in this section, Jesus is trying to expose that Christianity, the, the, the essence of what it really means to follow Jesus, is it's, an, it's not an outside-in job, but it's an inside-out job. And the reality is, here's the main point, because Jesus knows our hearts, He knows your heart. And He is Lord. We can give Him everything. We do not have to put on a front because He knows. And so the question I had, and I think that this text, I hope you see, um, it exposes heart rot. It exposes, I think, where it comes from and how it grows, but then also, how does it cure? I'm not talking about like real heart rot, like spiritual. How do we move out of a Christianity that is, oh, all we think about is what's on the outside instead of the inside? And how do we move into a Christianity of following Jesus from the inside out? Okay? How, how is heart rot exposed? And that's or it's detected in three observations today. I want to show you. Number one, heart rot begins with a misunderstanding of Jesus. Heart rot begins in your spiritual walk with a misunderstanding of who even Jesus is. Okay? So again, at the end of chapter 12, Jesus again, he's, he's had his battle with the Romans. He's had his bat battle with the Sadducees. He, he had his battle last week with the scribe. who We saw that he actually went to Jesus rightly. And, and now Jesus is turning uh, the tables, and he's going to ask a question. All the while, this chapter has been exposing, um, is, is Jesus someone who has wisdom and authority that we can trust? And Jesus is about to say, hey, let me, you know, you ask me a question. Let me ask you a question. And he turns to verse 35. He says, how can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? How can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? So at this moment, um, all the Jews would have understood that the Messiah, okay, the Messiah, they actually believed the Messiah was coming. Right? They, 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 the scribes would believe that. The Messiah was coming, and he would have come from the line of David. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, they were saying 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, Isaiah 9, Jeremiah 30. I mean, all around, it's just like the Messiah come from the line of David. But here's what they thought. 
They believed that he was just going to be some human messiah from the line of David to help deliver them from political oppression from the Romans. And what Jesus is doing here is so key because he is asking, he is asking one of life's most important questions, the most important question. He's exposing to these, everyone watching, he's asking, who am I actually? Who am I? Who actually is the Messiah? Who is Jesus? Is he just a human? What's that? Or is he divine? That's what Jesus would say. There's more. It's not just human. So verse 36 says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. Now this is interesting. He's about to quote, again, track with it. He's about to quote Psalm 1, uh, 110. But what's interesting is he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. I love this because he's automatically saying, um, David's song, like, you, yeah, David, that guy back there, David, he didn't, this, I'm not going to just point to something that David wrote, but this was in the Holy Spirit. As I say, scripture is empowered, it's, in, it's his authority, God, it's his book. He inspired um, Oh, I love it. That God wrote a book with humans. But it was inspired from the Spirit. Their, their nature, their, their little quirks and whatever. But it was inspired by Him. And this is, this is what He says in Psalm 119. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then Jesus says, David himself calls Him Lord. So how is he his son. Here's what Jesus is saying. You're like, man, this is complicated. I know it is. Because he just goes straight, Jesus goes straight academic. But here's essentially what Jesus is saying. What father would ever call his son or grandson Lord? Like, I love my boys. Alright? They great. Okay, it's fun. Get to the NBA from the first country, and it's fun. But I ain't calling around saying, hey, Lord. Lord, Lord. I ain't calling him Lord. I'm calling him a lot of things, but I'm not calling him Lord. Um, and and that, that's what he's saying. Jesus is saying, like, David knew the Messiah who would come from his lineage, and he's, he's also Lord. David is. He's saying that the Messiah isn't just some human Messiah coming to deliver. He's God. He's, he's bringing both his humanity and his divinity together. And he was correcting their view of who Jesus was. And we need to listen. We need to listen. If you're like, what does this have to do with me? That's great. But we've got to pay attention. Because Jesus was not just coming to be, again, a political ruler, he, to deliver them. He was coming to deliver them from a much deeper need. A heart need. He was coming to deliver them out of their sin. He was not just human, but he was divine. And see, if we are going to escape heart love, we have to start with who the real Jesus is, people. Am I a little fired up because the beauty and the reality of who Jesus really is is becoming diminished if we're not careful. See, Jesus is not just some teacher. He wasn't just some guru. Jesus is not some just personal life coach that, you know, hey, come on over here, Jesus. You know, you just sit right there for a second. And you just, you know, you just tell me how great I am and how great this is. He's not your personal life coach. 
So, like, when people tell you to um, uh, write your priorities out, I don't know if you've ever had to do this, and you start listing uh, your priorities, um, and, and you might be like, okay, well, you know, uh, Jesus is number one, uh, you know, family number two, or whatever like that. No, no, Jesus isn't just another priority. Jesus is like the piece of paper. That's what he's trying to say. He's like, I'm Lord. <laughs> That's what it means to be Lord. He's king. He's not a butler. And I, I, I just expose my own heart sometimes because I think I come to Jesus as if, again, uh, Jesus, you're just here for me. And Jesus is saying, hey, just a butler, I am king of the universe. I'm Lord. My question is, are you, are you coming to Jesus just when life is hard? Are you coming to Jesus just to get something? Or are we coming to Jesus just to get Jesus? Coming to Jesus with a blank check here it is. That's what he's trying to get at. That's what he's trying to expose. And if we misunderstand who the real Jesus is, it, our hearts will begin to grow in a hard rock type of way. And then it hard rock grows in hypocrisy. Ooh. And this, this, this text right here, it grows in hypocrisy. But look at verse 38. Jesus now turns to the scribes um, who again... They're the experts in the, the religious law. These would have given the, the seminary professors of the day with a doctor or reverend before their name, and he exposes their hypocrisy and pride. Um, again, their outward in behavior. And see, you can you can do again two things. You can operate. You can operate in your Christian walk um, for the smile of God. I am doing this for the smile of God or receiving the smile of God and for the soul of me. And again, these scribes are, we're going to see, they're operating the pain for the smile. I've got to earn his love. And so look at this. First, they, they like to walk around in long, white robes. These, these robes. They like to walk around in these robes. And um, I, by the way, um, I always hated it when my mom and dad would walk around in a robe in the house. Um, it was just weird. And if you're a robe person, don't, that's weird. Don't, don't be walking around the house in a robe. Um, I, sorry, I just had to say that. I just felt convicted. Like, uh, anyway, but it's not that kind of robe. All right, it's uh, it's these. They had these long prayer words with these taxes on there, and they, would, I mean, it would, it would show. Hey, look at me. I, I'm I'm some other position. They loved it. And then, um, um, as they walked around in these rows, they loved the greetings that they would get. Oh, that uh, teacher, and they would, they would, they would put them up a little bit. Maybe like, that's right. That's right. Call me red. Call me red. That's right. I love it. Call me. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were loved that position, and they also they didn't love the the back the back seats. Um, I remember um, the, the church I was before. It was so weird. Um, and if you're watching, if they're watching, sorry, I don't love you, but uh, it was weird. We had this seat in the back, um, and, and you know it was just it looked like a king's chalice or something. I don't know. It was just a big seat, and then we sit in the back and. Uh, People have authority. And I understand there's a place for that or whatever. But uh, the, the first, what they were saying is like they love the first seats. They love seats of position and honor. They loved um, their, their name. Uh, and then what, what was also even worse is they devoured widows' houses. You see that right there? They devoured widows' houses. And this isn't like. Uh, they went into the widows' houses and turned over their tables. And, uh, no, this was that uh, they were taking advantage of the widows in a way that they were 
maybe taxing them more for the services or, or you know, um, taking advantage because, hey, we'll, we'll come pray for you, but you got to pay, you gotta pay for this, pay for that. Um, like modern day televangelists, and this is crazy. I've heard some crazy things would say, hey, uh, you know, buy this prayer cloth and buy this special ointment from Jerusalem or whatever, and for 10,000, it will bring healing or whatever. I mean, it's, this is what they're doing. They, they, all they cared about, all they cared about is themselves, their name. And they did not actually care for their needs, that deep, deep needs of the widow. And finally, uh, he says, and for a pretense, meaning a show, they make long prayers. And some of you are like, amen. See, I told you we don't need to be praying long. Uh, but does, it, does it mean that it's wrong necessarily to pray long? Okay? But what he is saying is they were praying. They were praying long and they were praying so that people would say, They were praying for a sense of, look at me pray. Look at me pray. How can I sound something so loud? I remember, like, this was yesterday. I, we had a uh, renewal. It was like a uh, 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 revival at my at the church. Of, and and um, it was, this whole revival was on prayer. And I remember... Uh, the, the guy who was leading we were in these small groups and he was going around and he's like, what do you think about when you pray? And I remember it just struck me that I would think about the ooms in prayer. And here's what I mean. I don't know if you've ever prayed in a group before. And if you've ever prayed in a group before and you're praying in a group and you hear ooms, Mmm. Amen. Mmm. Now all of you guys will just never be able to pray for me again. I just realized this as I was thinking about it. <laughs> and you say, mmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. And that, you say, that, do that in prayer. But then it comes to you. Everyone's, you know, this person's praying. Everyone's, mmm. Mm. It comes to you. No one's, mmm. No one's saying, hey, amen. Mmm. And then you become self-conscious and you're thinking, and you don't even, you're not even know what you're praying anymore. You're just thinking about the moons. I mean, this is me. I'm being honest. Like, I would count. I mean, how many moons I'm getting? Like, ooh, can I get down deep? Like, ooh, Lord. And that, that could have been a moon. <laughs> and the reality is, I say that because, guys, the reality is do not point a finger at the scribe. Do you know why we say don't judge a book by its cover? It's because we like to judge books by their cover. We, we operate out of this idea of this outside in religion. If our hearts are not careful. And what, see what he is what Jesus is really trying to get here is what, again, um, what we learned last week. That this, I mean, that scribe was saying, God, um, he doesn't delight in sacrifices and all these things. I mean, he delights in a heart that loves him. Do you know one of my favorite uh, questions in the house? It's like, oh, that would be just so perfect if it lined up. I think it's next week's question is, what is prayer? What is prayer? Um, it's my favorite question in the New City Catechism. And because, and I, I by the way, just a little side note, the New City Catechism. Um, I love the Child's versions. Okay, the ones that got just the highlighted version. Uh, if you're wondering, like, oh, we're not memorizing the whole big thing, I, we're just trying to do the kids' version. I think the kids' version is the best. I mean, it's good. The highlighted part, you want know the kids' version of what is prayer? If someone came up to you and said, what is prayer? This is the an answer. What is prayer? Prayer is pouring out your heart to God. Pouring out your heart to God. 
real, raw, from the inside. Lord, it's for you. Do you love praying in a group outside of on your face in a closed door in your house where no one knows where you are? That's what he's saying. He's exposing their outside in. They're all about what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. Instead of heart surrender. See, Danny Aiken, um, I love how he says, this says, revelation brings responsibility. Revelation brings responsibility. The more you know, the greater is your accountability. And it says, one of the most dangerous places you can go is to a Bible-believing church that faithfully proclaims the gospel. You hear big truths every week. You got your ESP study Bible. You, man, you're doing the new city. You be even memorizing the new city. Woo! Like, you're just waiting for the day. You get called up here and say, I'll tell you, I'll memorize it right now. Right, here it is. You've got prayer apps on your phone. You've got all the things. And he said, the reality is, but that's where, he's saying you've got to be careful there because that's where your weight is. You know what I'm saying? That's just what the Philippians passage is talking. That's where your weight is instead of Christ. See, the more you are a Christian, listen, the more you are following Jesus, the more you, you, you start to see Him, you, you, this is what happens. You start shifting from outside to inside, and then when you start doing that, when you start seeing Jesus more, you grow more humble, not more prideful. I love how Luther says it. He says, grace is like water. It goes to the low places. And the Pharisees and the scribes, all they care about. My question is, where, what do you think about when you judge your Christian walk? Is it by what are we doing? Or are you saying, does my heart actually delight and joy Jesus? I can pray. Is it to earn his smile? Or is it because he's already smiled back? You just want to earn heart? That's what he's saying. And so it grows. How about it grows from heart receiving the funny heart rock is cured by surrender. It's cured by surrender. Jesus compares these uh, the outside in scribes to an inside out widow. Verse 41, he says, Jesus is he's sitting opposite of the treasury and he watched the people putting money in the offering box. And how awesome is that? Jesus is just watching people. Uh, yeah, uh, imagine. I mean, uh, he's just watching people putting money in this offering box and just... This box would have been like this big trumpet-like uh, receptacle. And by the way, this would have been, um, they didn't have like dollar bills back then. This would have been, uh, they would have been throwing coins in, okay? And, and every time you, a bigger donation going in there, bigger the noise. How awkward would that be? You go out there and have a ding, 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 thing, like for every higher or low dollar amount you put in. Um, I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what the reality is. They were, they knew what people were giving. And this poor widow came up, verse 42, and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Now, like literally, this would have been like pennies. Small, small, I mean, just small, I mean, it would have been like nothing, nothing. And what's amazing here is he calls in the disciples, hey, the disciples, come on in here, uh, because I want to I wanna direct your attention to something. He says, this poor widow has put in more than all those contributions to the offering box. Verse 44, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. He said, everyone's giving out of their surplus, but this 
widow has given the most beautiful offering. And I love how one author says, God does, so in the summary of this, he says, God does not want our money. He wants us. Yet, we cannot give ourselves to him apart from our money. Essentially, what he's celebrating here is, again, the inward reality. This will do. It's, like, I, it's, it's not about this big offering, how much I'm giving, whatever, but the heart reality is she was treasuring and gave. See, greed is a tricky thing. Greed is a very tricky sin. Yeah, been in for some time. It's, it's interesting. No one's ever remember. I'm just so greedy. Because it's a blind reality. We're blinded to some of our greed. And the way you protect your greed is give. That's what he's essentially saying. And then, but what, what really, I'm playing the plan here. This is so important. Though. Why would Jesus end his all of this section on his authority, on his wisdom, on his mind, on all his goodness, and with a story about a winner giving two small copper coins. Why? I think it comes in the translation of this last little bit. It says, literally, it says that she laid down, she gave all she had. Greek literally reads her very life. She gave her very life. She was saying, here's all of me. She was putting her weight on a greater treasure and reality. And it was trusting in God. She was coming to the end of herself. And the reason why she could, and I love this, and the reason why you can, is noticing that, that Jesus, in a way, is the greater widow here. He was the one who was devoured for your sake. He didn't just give. He didn't just give um, his last couple of coins. He gave his life. He gave his life. In 1849, uh, Blondin, he's a famous uh, French tightrope walker. Um, he stretched a rope across uh, Niagara Falls and he walked across it in front of 10,000 people. And they were very excited. Uh, they thought this was amazing. Uh, and Harry um, Coldcourt, I think that's his name, Harry Coldcourt uh, was very excited. Well, it was his manager and said, let's, let's, keep, let's keep doing, um, let's do more, let's do more. And so, uh, they did. They started doing all these, you know, these crazy tightrope walking things across Niagara Falls. Like he cooked an egg, you know, blonde went out and had a little thing. He cooked an egg in the middle of, of this tightrope over Niagara Falls. It was crazy. He said, okay, we need one big final trick. One big final trick. What can we, what can we do? And blonde thought, I can carry someone across. Uh, and you know, Harry's like, that's a great idea. It's a great idea. And now, now we're risking two lives. And so they said, you know, sure enough, they got their biggest crowd ever. And um, before then, they said, is anybody willing to do it? Um, would anybody willing to do this? And lots of people came and said, I'd be willing. And um, so I'll give a thousand bucks to whoever would go across this line with me. And sure enough, all these people came and Blonde was like, let me show you that I can do this. Make sure, you know, I can do this. And so he walked out on the tightrope, did his little thing, and danced around on it. And he was, wow, amazed. And he came back. And he said, okay, you guys actually think I can do this? And they're like, yes! What do you think you can do it? He's like, okay, who wants to do it? No one, no one wanted to do it. No one wanted to do it. He said, yeah, what do you think you can do it? No one wanted to do it. And again, I think that's... Our problem is not just intellectual, but are we willing to give our life? And then what was amazing was Lana turned to Harry and said, Okay, Harry, you're finally going to have to do this. And Harry's like, Okay, 
gets on his back. They start going out to the middle of the tightrope. And Harry starts freaking out. And he starts swaying, trying to get the balance and, and all over. And they're, I mean, they're about to fall. Uh, you can tell uh, the newspapers were saying they're about to fall. And this is what Blondin said to Harry. He said, Harry, until I clear this place, you must become a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, you must rest in me completely and sway completely with me. Don't attempt to do anything yourself. Because if you do, we will both go down to our death. Don't attempt to do any balancing to yourself. Blondin said, if you try to save yourself, Harry, you end up losing yourself. And the reality is, Jesus is saying the same thing. See, a hard rock begins when we don't understand who Jesus is. He is true the Lord. It grows then when we don't see his true the Lord. He's just a God who put on around as his buddy. And we make Christianity all about the things we're doing. But it's destroyed. It's destroyed. When we finally say, you know what? I actually understand what Christianity is about. It's actually about surrender. It's actually about giving up. It's actually about giving up my life unto the one who will never drop me. The one who did come and save me despite of me. And then when you surrender, and now you surrender, your, your hope is not in your job. Your hope is not in your kids. Your hope is not in your bound, your, your money. Your hope is not in your, your name. This, the heart is surrendered on Jesus. The inside is rock solid. So that means when you lose your job, when you lose your reputation, when you lose this, you lose that, it doesn't make your heart surrender. And it's anchored. And the one who will never abandon you. Turn to Jesus and watch your heart rock be destroyed. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word. And I pray that God, you will just take this word. And Lord, we we just we just admit any time that Lord, we have just looked on the outside. We look to things we do or we and even just that normal prayer. If we, we judge our prayers and we're thinking, like, help our hearts. Help us to truly see. And you didn't just give a look. You gave You were, in a sense, the God where you were, in a sense, killed so we didn't have to. You gave everything for us, Jesus. And Father, you call us to trust you, to get on your back, metaphorically speaking, and walk across that road. And Lord, where we are wanting to sway and say, no, 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 I'm leaving this way, I'm going to go this way, I'm going to go this way, to help our hearts just to surrender to this way. Understanding that you know everything that is best for us. And your call for us this morning and again is to come the end of ourselves. And I pray, Holy Spirit, if you've been working on hearts that have been coming here and they have not surrendered to you, they have not put faith in you, they have been and they and they heard the good news that Jesus, you came to forgive them of the past, present, and future sin. And that you are the one that died for them, loves them, comes to redeem them. However words you would give them, they would repent and they would believe that Jesus, you're not just a good teacher, but believe Jesus that you are the Son of God. 
and your glory. And Holy Spirit, you would begin the miracle of faith through this morning. And Holy Spirit, help us. Help us not just to be hearers, but doers of